Good evening, everyone. Thank you for volunteering to review proposals for the Literacy Research Association's 2018 conference, Reclaiming Literacy Research, Centering Activism, Community, and Love, to be held in Indian Wells, California, November 27th through December 1st. The peer review process is a vital part of ensuring high quality, ensuring a high quality, rigorous program featuring current literacy research. Area chairs depend on your expertise to review proposals that have been submitted and make a recommendation about the proposal for the conference program. Authors look forward to reviewers' feedback to strengthen their research. The call for proposals has now closed. Area chairs will soon be assigning proposals for you to review. It is our hope that this webinar will walk you through the review process and the technical aspects of accessing and submitting your reviews in all academic. Just a few reminders as we uh, begin the webinar. One, you want to make sure that you please mute your audio. If you have questions um, uh, throughout the webinar, you'll notice that there's the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Please use the chat function to um, write in any questions that you might have or comments. The first part of the webinar will be more information, but toward the end, you'll have a lot of opportunities to have your questions answered. And then we'll also use the function of how to raise your virtual hand. You'll notice um, if you click on the word participants, you can see who is in the meeting, including yourself. And if you want to raise your hand so that the host uh, can call on you or prompt you to um, talk, you'll notice an option to raise hand. So just be uh, mindful of those options as we go through the webinar. Let's begin with introductions. On this web webinar, we have myself, Dieter Price Dennis, te um, at Teachers College, Columbia University. I'll be serving as the moderator. I'm Elizabeth Dutro from University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm a member of the LRA board. I'm Barbara Laster. I'm from Towson University in Baltimore, and I'm part of the ethics committee. Hi, I'm Melissa Wetzel, University of Texas at Austin, and I am the co-chair for Area One. Uh, Peggy Simonson will also be on the webinar, um, hopefully soon. I'm Marcel Haddix, so I'm at Syracuse University, and I'm currently the uh, LRA president-elect and chair, conference chair for the 2018 conference in Indian Wells, California. In the webinar this evening, we hope to provide an overview of the different kinds of submissions, review criteria for acceptance, rating proposals and writing reviews, suggestions for um, generating constructive feedback to the authors, acknowledging and responding to bias, ethical considerations, and then engage with um, in question and answers with those of you who've joined us this evening. So there's different types of submissions um, for the LRA conference. We have individual papers that can take the shape um, of a research report or a theoretical paper. We have round table and posters, um, which are typically reserved for research in progress and are presented in an interactive forum. We also have symposiums. And a symposium brings together literacy research focused on a strong unifying theme. A symposium typically consists of a chair, three speakers, and a discussant, but other arrangements are possible. Ample opportunity for audience participation should be taken into consideration. In the proposal, each speaker should have a focused topic and a title. Another type of submission is the alternative format. An alternative format session presents significant research-based issues representing a strong unifying theme. These 90-minute sessions are creative alternatives in which the presenters share their research and engage participants through, inter excuse me, through alternative modes, including theater or performance, media and technology, simulations, cultural circles, interactive inquiry, think tank sessions, etc. The last type of submission um, is a study group. 
Study groups provide an opportunity for focused, well-planned, and well-led discussions of new concepts and research related to a topic. Study groups meet each day of the conference and attendance is open to all meeting participants. Study group proposals do not need to mask the author or author's identity. Indeed, some of the indication of the leader's experience and expertise is welcome. Now we're gonna look at the criteria for review. Marcel, do you mind walking us through some of this? Criteria for review that reviewers will um, consider um, as you, you review and rate proposals. First, you want to think about, is this proposal significant to the field? How is it bringing something new or extending um, where we currently are and think about a particular topic? Is its theoretical framing relevant to the research questions and methodology? Is the research design and methodology clearly described? Are the results, interpretations, conclusions trustworthy? Is the proposal clearly grounded in relevant scholarship? Is the proposal clear? Does the proposal connect to the conference theme? And does the proposal give attention to issues of equity and inclusion? So those are the criteria that you will see in the rubric and the questions that you will um, want to consider as you provide your review. Okay, in addition to um, that criteria, <laughs> we like to think about um, the following criteria on this screen as you review um, symposia and alternative format proposals. Is there coherence across the papers and presentations? And is there evidence of multiple perspectives and presenters from more than one institution? And when you think about reviewing for study groups, we want you to consider this criteria. Does the proposal have a strong rationale grounded in relevant literature? And is there a well-organized and feasible agenda? Lastly, are the facilitators qualified to do the work that they are stating in their proposal for the study group? As you're reviewing for roundtables and posters, the criteria for acceptance for roundtables and poster sessions is very similar to the paper sessions. However, you should keep in mind that roundtables and posters are research and progress reports, and they may describe a study in progress. This means that the findings and interpretations may be interim or developing. Next, we're gonna look at giving feedback and starting with strengths. Um, I'm gonna ask Elizabeth and Melissa to jump in and to give us their perspectives on generating constructive feedback to the authors. So, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, this is Elizabeth. And I was, um, I found this slide so helpful and it made me think about how even in a proposal that as a reviewer you might find is not ready for presentation at the conference. There's always something positive to highlight. And this is important, especially I think about because newer members of the research community are most certainly some of the scholars submitting proposals. So we wanna provide acknowledgement of important aspects of the work and provide hope and motivation that can sustain emerging literacy scholars even as constructive feedback and suggestions is, of course, so important. So I will just um, add on to that. And, um, and what I liked about this slide was the, uh, the uh, providing us with the language to do so. So, um, so this is actual language that you might be able to use or to uh, modify to fit your, um, the review. But the, the language is the topic in this paper is timely. You could explain why you think this research is important right now, um, is grounded in relevant literature, offers a new perspective, and is important to LRA members in the field and explain why um, you feel that about this topic. And then I like this language of I especially appreciate or value or noticed or thought it was significant. 
um, that language really helps us to um, to pose these this next set of um, of constructive feedback. I especially appreciated that the questions were clearly laid out. That the piece, um, the literature review, made a um, a coherent argument, um, and so on. So this language of of what you value, what you appreciated, what you saw as the strengths is um, is really helpful as you're crafting this part of your review. Thank you both for providing that type of insight for our reviewers. We're going to now move to thinking about. I can get my computer to function. <laughs> Providing more um, feedback to symposium and alternative sessions. And so I'll ask for Barbara and Elizabeth to um, jump in here and share some ideas and insights you have. Elizabeth's still on mute. She has to turn off mute. So I'll just jump in and say that we are very interested in, again, starting with the strengths as we give feedback to authors. Um, we like to say things like the presentation, whether it's a symposium or alternative session or whatever, is well planned. You know, timing for these sessions is very important, that there's time for perhaps a panel presentation and time for question and answer or breakout. Um, that there are multiple perspectives, and this is really important as we look at the theme for uh, this next year's conference, that we are bringing in voices of all sorts of people and that we are looking for new perspectives um, and traditional perspectives also. And so therefore the presentation possibly will offer new directions for our field. Um, we're interested in symposiums and alternative sessions that are interactive, that involve the atten attendees. Um, and furthermore, that the implications are clear uh, and related to the conference theme. Um, certainly, we want everything to be relevant, current in our field. Elizabeth, did you have something to add? Just briefly, um, I'll add that's, that was so important. And that these, on this slide, these are such important examples of the kinds of strengths to highlight. And they're also, I found them really great reminders of the varying kinds of proposals you may read and the need to keep the various forms of work being proposed in mind from empirical research studies, the conceptual or theoretical paper, the in-progress studies that might be proposed in some of these sessions. Absolutely, thank you both. And now I'm gonna ask Barbara and Melissa to um, share more insights. Oops, sorry about that. Um, or another mic went. Or maybe we are. Slide, go back no, we're to good. The methodologies. This one? One more back. There we go. All right. Okay. Barbara, is it okay if I start? <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of the um, starting with strengths, of course, there are going to be um, places here for you to generate constructive feedback for the authors. And we think this is helpful, even if the proposal is very well crafted and the research is strong and you think it probably um, should be accepted in the con into the conference. Um, what kind of feedback can you provide the authors um, from your expertise, from, your, from where you stand, that might be helpful for them in thinking about either the presentation or the proposal or, um, um, or their future work? And so, um, so ways that you might be able to frame the constructive feedback is that, um, I'm sorry, are we still on um, strengths? About the methods. Oh, about the methods and findings. I'm sorry, I jumped a couple slides ahead. So I've already said something for a few slides ahead, but for this one, <laughs> we're, um, we're looking at, in terms of the strengths, when you're looking at methods and findings, um, have, have the authors really been able to clearly describe those methods and findings? And keep in mind the word limitations. So were they able to call some of the most important pieces um, to, to bring out into the proposal? Um, and then from your perspective, are the methods trustworthy? Um, one thing that you'll want to look at is whether it seems the analysis has been completed um, and that it's in the final stages, if not complete. 
And, um, and then even in terms of a roundtable session, that enough analysis has been done that it seems that the findings are going to be um, promising. And here, I'll turn it over to you, Barbara. I would just add, um, thank you very much, Melissa. I would just add that um, sometimes we like to make a comment about how the methods or how the design fits the actual problem. So having a good match, a good fit for methodology and the concern, the problem, the hypothesis. Yeah. Well, I think we're on our next slide now. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to move to um, communicating um, limitations using constructive feedback. And it looks like Marcel, Elizabeth, and Melissa will talk to us, talk to us about some ideas here. So for communicating limitations, um, you know, this is really important. And we'll talk about this a bit um, more when we um, discuss the rating, the scores, because you really want to be thoughtful and um, very, you know, direct and clear about what it is about the proposal um, that you find in terms of limitations, but you also want to be thoughtful and kind and generous in how you communicate that. Um, so, you know, to say that the topic is interesting, um, but it needs more focus, um, maybe it's unclear, so issues around clarity. I'm trying to be as exact in your language in, in describing that, um, you know, areas where, um, you know, I always find in communicating limitations, you don't want to just point something out, but perhaps offer some kind of feedback about what you'd like to see or how you can encourage the author to think about what they may add um, moving forward as it relates to focus, as it relates to clarity, as it relates to the method. So maybe even thinking about framing your, your um, the way, the language that you use and asking questions to help um, the author to think about how they might communicate that in future proposals or future work. I can just follow up on that because one of the things that so struck me, again, I'm so glad these slides will be available to people because having stems like this just to turn to is really important. And uh, one thing that occurred to me is that when we're using these really important kind of focused stems to call up what we really mean, what we're pointing at, one other like follow on stem that just um, connects to what Marcel was saying that I like to think about is a framing of one productive route towards strengthening this aspect of the proposal would be. And then just, you know, give the authors a suggestion. Um, is, those are the strongest reviews that provide some concrete kinds of direction. Okay, so Marcel, Barbara, and Elizabeth are, con are going to continue um, building on what the information they just shared by now focusing on um, providing constructive feedback and communicating limitations around theoretical framing and analysis. Whoops, there we go. Who wants to start? <laughs> I need to remember my raising the hand. <laughs> Um, I, can add, I can jump in here, uh, but feel free to, to add. I think, um, you know, the, the point around theoretical framing, I think, is really important. And also, um, just thinking about how you situate the work uh, related to, you know, how, how an author situates the work related to um, broader conversations and being able to point out in communicating constructive feedback um maybe the questions or the the um the articulations that weren't so clear um but being able to name that, that to say that it's not outlined that you'd like to see further elaboration in this area or to ask you know asking questions to help them um better communicate and think about and explore um the theories that ground the work um you know, with analysis, and I, I think we, I've seen this a lot in proposals in the past where um, there's no discussion around um, the analysis, what's done, what findings there are, and that's really important for, um, you know, presenting at the conference at this stage, unless it is a research um, 
prog project that's in progress, uh, whether it's around being a round table or a poster. So this needs to be um, really developed in the proposal. And so if it isn't being able to use this language to be able to uh, ask the authors to explore that further. Well, I'll just jump in and, and say the last part, which is that um, we want to know, and so we communicate the limitation, as some people said, uh, about data analysis and collection that was not clearly defined. We could say something uh, that was helpful by saying, um, I look forward to seeing a revision in which there's more definition of how data was collected, of how data was analyzed. Um, and I'd love to see an elaboration of how the data analysis um, links to the findings. I'll just add briefly that one caution I think about in ensuring that um, feedback on limitations around theoretical frameworks is constructed and is constructive um, is just another Reminder to remember that papers can take various forms and genres in the conference. Um, one pitfall we sometimes see in reviewers' approaches is that a proposal will be given a low score on data sources or data analysis when a paper is proposed as a conceptual piece and not an empirical study. And if you're ever unsure about genre and how to approach a paper, it's absolutely a good idea to reach out to one of the area co-chairs for feedback and just conversation and support. That's an excellent point, Elizabeth. Very good point. So we're gonna shift a little bit now and think about um, how to provide constructive feedback to our symposium and alternative session proposals. And I believe we have um, maybe Marcel, Barbara, and Melissa talking with us on this slide. Sure. Um, so when you're giving feedback um, on limitations for symposiums and for um, alternative sessions, um, you're looking at the whole, um, the whole symposium or session together and looking to see whether, um, whether perhaps there was an unclear plan. It's not quite um, clear how the authors together are going to um, present this, this work together. Um, one thing you'll find often, and, and as area chairs, I think we've seen this, is that in a symposium or alternative session, there's really just one perspective, um, maybe broken up into multiple papers, rather than papers that um, provide different perspectives on a question or a research topic that, um, uh, that really will talk to each other and provoke some dialogue um, or some different ways to think about a common problem. And, um, and so your feedback might um, focus on how you see this as a whole. Um, and then also as a whole, uh, does, it, does it appear that the presentation perhaps is, is, is sharing familiar findings um, or familiar approaches to a line of inquiry rather than more challenging directions? That's another um, a place where you might provide feedback on limitations. And then in terms of the implications, um, if, if you don't see a clear relevance to either current um, concerns or the conference theme, that's something to comment into here and in every review. Um, or if you see that the implications um, maybe were clearly stated but not um, supported by the papers and they were unwarranted, that's another place where you could um, comment. And I think I'll just stop by saying that um, these symposiums and alternative sessions, we have fewer spaces for them and so the um, we really rely on reviewers to think um, both about the individual papers or, or components but also really as the whole um, and whether or not this session would draw an audience and really move the field forward um, which we hope that these sessions will do well done melissa i have nothing to add <laughs> i agree i'll, I'll just say um and we talked a little bit about the study groups that this the same to your final point that you know the study groups happen over the lunch hour on um wednesday thursday and friday and so there is limited um opportunities there so we'll also be looking for you know really that the clear relevance um a really clearly articulated plan um how it's going to inform 
you know, current research and provide for ways for people from multiple perspectives to come together and study and explore a particular topic. So those proposals um, need to be just as um, well, uh, well defined and um, elaborated on um, as well. So I just wanna add that. Absolutely. And occasionally as volunteers, um, volunteer reviewers, we find ourselves, even with all of this incredible um, information provided in the PowerPoint thus far, kind of at a loss at how to respond to some of the proposals that we review. And so then I ask um, Elizabeth and Barbara to help us think about what are some other types of um, responses that reviewers may um, share with the authors of the proposals. Well, I could start. I was, oh, yeah, I'm getting an echo, sorry. Um, I was struck by how helpful it is to think about some of the issues in this slide as reviewers. And just as a reminder to reviewers, it truly is expected that all proposals meet some minimum standards, including word count and a level of editing and adherence to APA. And that's, of course, very different from content and ideas. And that can be hard if you come across a proposal that includes a focus you find very important and perhaps well articulated, but the proposal doesn't meet the clear guidelines of word count, for example, or the sections the call requires or APA. So if there are a few editing issues, of course that's not a deal breaker, and I know we'll talk more about some of the important reasons for that when we talk about um, bias coming up. However, issues such as word count, required sections, and APA really matter, because all submitters are working with some of those requirements, and most work really hard to adhere to them. I would just underline the first point there that we are looking for, um, work that has not been published elsewhere. It should be new. It should be um, something that is cutting edge. Even though it may be along a traditional line of work, um, I know that we are, are fascinating with new genre, with new approaches, but we also know that we, among the LRA community, we have people who have had years and years, decades of work along one line and they're just pushing it forward and pushing it forward, but not replicating something that's already been done. So it's a fine line that we walk. And can I just add to that, um, one thing that, that folks should know is that area chairs, before they send their proposals out for review, they do uh, do a pre-screening and a review of all of the proposals that have been submitted to that area. And, you know, at times, perhaps there's an issue with word limit. Um, depending on the situation, area chairs consult with me as the program conference chair to say, should we reach out to the authors before we send this out to review um, to make sure that it meets some of those basic criteria for submission. So as reviewers, the hope is that you won't get uh, proposals that may have some of these issues. It does happen, but I just want to let folks know that there is a, a kind of two-week pre-screening process where area chairs work with me and each other to make sure that proposals are ready to go out to reviewers. Absolutely. And so volunteers, you know, as you're thinking about you've read the proposals, you've taken notes about the strengths, you've taken notes about constructive feedback, now it's time to score it. What are some things to think about then? And so Melissa and Marcel, can you talk to us a little bit about scoring the um, proposals? Um, so the scoring is really important and helpful for area chairs. Um, the comments that you write, the constructive feedback and the, and the strengths that you write are very helpful, but the scores are helpful too because if you think about the number of proposals that we're reviewing, one, um, one way to think about the reviews is, is in terms of scores. So, um, so in, in scoring each proposal, you have the option to rate um, in each of these areas from a one to a five. So the first thing is to be sure 
that um, that you're that you're using the scale of one as the minimum and five five as the maximum. Um, I've I've looked at um, interviews where the comments were very positive and very complimentary, and the numbers were very low, and it was just simply because the reviewers use the scale um, uh, the opposite way. Did I say that correctly? Okay, good. Um, and so that's the first thing I think to consider. And then the second thing to consider is if you think about um, a proposal or an area that you rate as a five, that's an exemplary um, proposal in that area. Not all proposals are going to score, that we accept are gonna score as a five in, in, all, in an area or in all areas. Uh, five is really um, an exemplary um, rating. And so we would expect to see even a proposal that was accepted that might have threes and fours and fives. Um, so it's not necessary to rate, if you think a, a proposal should be accepted, it's not necessarily to rate it um, across the board you know, with fives. So your rating, your rating should really um, reflect that, that five um, rating as a highly significant, highly developed, sub, um, uh, substantive, and I'm having trouble reading them, these, those are those ratings really mean that. Um, so, um, so along with being sure that the ratings that you're using are, um, you're using the scale correctly and that your ratings um, really reflect the descriptors that are here. The other thing I think to think about is that, um, is that um, those, the comments and the ratings should have a high correspondence. So if you um, provided almost all um, feedback on strengths and you were very complimentary, then that should be reflected in the scale scores as well. And if it's not, then it's, it's sort of confusing for area chairs to figure out um, whether or not a proposal should be accepted. So just kind of keep in mind the, the correspondence between the numbers, the numerical scores, and the, um, and the feedback that you provide. And Marcel, what could you add, for, add to that? Yeah, I, you know, I think I just want to underscore what you said. I think, you know, if you give low scores, just as we talked about how you communicate those limitations, um, it's really important to be really clear and direct about why you're giving those scores. It's very helpful information to the area chairs and to myself. Um, and, you know, for me, I've seen reviews in the past where a person will score something really high and then there'll be like one or two, you know, sentences. It was a good, it's a good proposal. Or I think this should be included in the conference without really providing the area chairs because we do have, we get so many uh, proposals, we have to make some tough decisions. So it's important that your uh, reviews distinguish why those ratings were given. That's really important and very helpful to us as we plan the program. Well, thank you both. Um, the next slide we're gonna look at are ethical considerations. And I think this is such an important thing as a community for us to have a conversation about, and I really appreciate having it um, on this webinar tonight. I'm wondering if um, Barbara and Melissa, if you want to jump in and talk to us a little bit about what reviewers should be thinking about or what they should do to problem solve any issues around ethics that they have after they have read a proposal. So Melissa, do you want to read what's on the slide and talk about those things? And I'll talk about a few things that aren't on the slide. Sure, sure. So one thing to consider is if you begin to read a proposal and you realize that it, the research seems very familiar to you, um, that you know the work and you know the author, it would be completely, it is appropriate and you, and you, and you should send it back to the area chairs um, and you can ask for a different proposal to review. Um, and that way um, you won't feel, um, uh, you or the author won't feel compromised by that, um, that inside knowledge. Um, if the proposal seems to be outside of your area of expertise, it's really best to send it back to the area chairs. Um, I think this is important because um, we want to make sure that proposals are rated, are really reviewed fairly. And if you're not familiar with either the content area, the, um, um, the, the category of age uh, of student that it applies to or the methodology and probably particularly the, me the methodology, it might be very hard for you to provide a comprehensive and, um, and fair review for the piece. So it's better to send it back and say, I'm not quite, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to, to review this proposal. 
Um, also, be sure that um, you keep your submissions confidential. You don't want to invite somebody else in to review with you or to share it as a, um, oh, hey, look at this interesting work that someone's doing. Uh, your role as a reviewer is um, it, your your um, responsibility is to keep confidential pieces that are um, that are submitted to you for review. And I know we're going to talk more about microaggressions, so I won't um, go into it on this slide. But I'll turn the floor over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Melissa. I just wanted to add some um, reminders that most people know about the content of the actual submission. And that is, it would be nice if um, you got a you got a submission that said the I accepted or approved this, but sometimes we don't get that. Sometimes people don't put that in their submission. And so I would say it's important to have critical eyes to make sure that privacy um, and confidentiality are met when they're talking about the participants or the subjects in the study. I think that we have to be um, an extra um, fence around this uh, to protect the, the, the communities that we do research with. You know, we used to talk about doing research on, but we do research with communities, with people. And so I think we should take an extra lens to make sure that the, the subjects or participants in a study are protected and are given voice. So we might talk more about that in another slide too. Thank you so much, Barbara and Melissa, for talking through some of the ethical reviews. I'm just going to remind um, all of the folks who are joining, this, joining us this evening to please make sure that you have um, your volume muted unless you are talking, just to help the rest of us hear and to minimize background noise. Um, and that was a really great point to make at the end about making sure that all voices are being able to um, have a space to be heard as we start thinking about um, microaggressions and an implicit and explicit bias. Marcel and Elizabeth, I'm wondering if you could talk with us um, and really help reviewers think through some of, the, some of the ways that they can be mindful of this as they are um, you know, putting in their ideas for these proposals. Um, I'm happy to start, uh, Elizabeth. Um, one, I'll just say I don't like the term microaggressions. Um, because I often feel like they're, they are very um, explicit and they are directly related to the macro issues as well. Um, but they're the ways within our scholarship when um, are responding to um, our colleagues that we dismiss or we insult um, who they are and their work. And oftentimes you see this happening to um, our colleagues who may come from minoritized groups, our international colleagues, colleagues um, where English is their um, dominant language. So there are ways in which um, um, these biases and, and aggressions are um, taken up, even in reviews. And so you want to be mindful of paying attention to those things as they happen. Um, I'll talk to, through the first example here. These are actual examples of things that have happened um, in past um, reviews. Um, there was a review of a study of teacher education in South Africa. Um, a review told the author that there was no relevance to the U.S. context. So um, one of the things that we've really encouraged over the last um, several years, um, and we're seeing an increase in involvement from our uh, international scholars, um, and that's very uh, apparent and evident even in the inclusion of an area for uh, research related to international issues. Um, and so to the, the thought that somehow um, U.S. or uh, centric um, contexts have to be centered in or always have to be um, the comparison for is, is um, privileging U.S. or Western ideas and context. And so it's really important to when you see those kinds of studies where, you know, um, another example would be, well, if, you, if you're looking at students of color or English language learners, how do they compare to their white counterparts? Like always thinking that knowledge or certain um, 
um, experiences or epistemology somehow have to be compared to a dominant culture or dominant ideologies. Elizabeth. Thanks, Marcel. Yeah, I could just, um, I'll just add that, yeah, these are issues around language and our own assumptions that all of us, particularly those of us living privileged identities, consistently have to bring to conscious awareness and a level of self-critique in our roles as reviewers, I mean, just as we would hope to do in our daily lives and interactions with others. So in the same way that we would hope to see reflexivity about our own positioning and our research, reviewing requires a process of self-questioning around the critiques we may have and the language through which we express those critiques that um, is, you know, positioning proposals, but then and others, participants and authors um, in really challenging ways. Um, so, yeah. Elizabeth, that is a great segue to um, our next slide. And I'm going to invite Melissa to jump in this conversation and also offer us some insight, um, along with Barbara, I believe, around um, just some of these particular stems that may pop up. Sure. I, um, I really love these stems. Um, I think there are more that we could probably add here, too. Um, I, I think we've talked about this idea of a comparison group, but um, the phrase underdeveloped, I think is an interesting phrase um, because sometimes it's used to refer to, um, to papers or studies um, that were designed from a, a different, par uh, different paradigm or a different set of assumptions. Um, and so, um, so we just wanna be really mindful of language like underdeveloped that isn't specific, but instead might um, refer to a, just a, different, a difference in paradigm. And that relates to the next point too. Um, I, as an area chair, have read review reviews that um, say, um, I thought it was interesting or I just didn't understand. Um, and it positions and centers the, the reviewer um, as the gatekeeper of whether or not uh, the, the proposal and the research is worthy and worthy of, um, of sharing and getting feedback and being part of the conversation um, by, by positioning the reviewer as someone who, um, who must understand or must um, you know, have sort of a, um, a, a certain perspective in order for this to be a, a good proposal. Um, and then the final one, um, I think, is a really good challenge for all of us. Um, the idea that we as reviewers can decide whether or not um, a, a piece, a study, relates to literacy is a place where we might really find ourselves um, slipping into this um, idea of microaggressions or bias. Um, what definitions of literacy are accepted or are allowed to enter to the, into the conversation? Um, is that um, we can gatekeep in many ways um, through that, through walking through that doorway. So if a, um, if a scholar hasn't defined literacy in the same ways that you define that, it might be an opportunity for you to pose a question um, for the reviewer in terms of thinking about sharing their work or proposing their work or writing about their work, um, but posing the question, is this literacy as a challenge to the um, proposal, I think could be, um, definitely interpreted by a, an area chair or by an author as a, a microaggression or bias. Those are excellent, excellent points, Melissa. And I would just um, underline some more about the, um, the theme of this year's conference, which is about um, literacy that's humanizing. Um, I think that we sometimes have stayed with the same groups, the same voices. And I think it's our challenge this year, particularly to go across many different places and populations and uh, to ask whether um, we've heard from all different kinds of people within a project. So uh, again, I'm uh, just as a reviewer hoping to make sure that I think about diversity, I think about inclusion, I think about equity and justice, all those things that we talk about in a broad way, this is our chance to really do something. Absolutely. And I think um, we'll move to one more slide under this um, 
umbrella of microaggressions and implicit and explicit bias. And that really is um, thinking about our own privilege and power as reviewers. And I'm wondering if I can have Elizabeth join um, the conversation with Barbara around just talking to us about some of these ideas for us to consider as reviewers. Sure. Um, this slide is such a good reminder that as reviewers, we have to be aware of the traditions with which we're familiar and those with which we're unfamiliar. Um, we can hope that proposals are well matched with reviewer expertise. I mean, we always try as area chairs to do that. Um, but this can't be the case across the board. We may have familiarity with topic area in the field, but then are asked to engage with theoretical lenses and our participant life experiences that are very different from our own. Again, if you find yourself thinking about some of the phrases on this slide when reviewing a proposal, I would just really encourage all of us to use that as a self-check. We can turn those questions about a proposal into questions about our ability to fairly assess a proposal strengths and contributions. As I mentioned earlier, this would be a time when turning to the area chairs for assistance and discussion can be important, so never hesitate to do that. It's far better to reach out and express concern that you may not be an appropriate reviewer for a proposal than to forge ahead and possibly assess a proposal that in a way that may be unfair and inadvertently undermine equity and diversity in the work represented at the conference. Excellent. I have nothing to add. Wonderful job, Elizabeth. Well, thank you all so much. We're going to move into the second part um, of our webinar. Um, but before we do, just a reminder to all the reviewers who are joining us that the reviews will be due May 2nd and to thank you for volunteering for this very important service to LRA. At this time, Peggy um, will go ahead and open up the Q&A, and we remind you to use the hand wave function to um, pose questions, and that way we can acknowledge you and um, jump in. Thank you. So I, I'm going to chime in. This is Marcel. I think um, Peggy was trying to reboot because she was having some audio issues. Um, and so I'm happy to help uh, moderate if there are questions that people <coughs> pose. Um, one thing that I just want to add to um, just listening to the, the final part of the presentation around microaggressions and, and um, bias, um, and I would just offer this to everyone, is just think about how you, uh, will, will, how you receive reviews, you know when you write a review for someone else's work, how you would feel if you were the recipient of that work. And I know that sounds very basic, but a lot of times, and this is why I say I, I have challenges with the word microaggression, because people experience um, feedback in very violent ways at times, depending on how it's delivered and, and the type of language that individuals use. Um, and it, it, is, it is not within the theme of love or in the theme of being humanizing or caring for, you know, for others. So, I would just offer that as well. I think it's just really, um, you know, how we're being thoughtful about and respectful to, to our colleagues. You know, we, we are a community of scholars. And so even if it's work that you don't understand or it's not the type of work that you do, we should still have respect for one another and for our common interest in wanting to, um, you know, support and help youth and communities um, when it comes to the work we do in literacy research. So are there any questions um, out there about the review process or, yep, I, I, Barbara? I see in the chat box, there's someone who had a question early on at 736. And the question was, and it's good to answer this one, do the proposals include names? I'm a bit confused about the point regarding papers from close colleagues or students. Ah. Well, no, the only um, reviews that are not blinded are the study group um, reviews, um, proposals, excuse me. Um, the other proposals should be blinded. However, the point is, is that you may find yourself, especially because, just think about this, you sign up and volunteer to be a reviewer often in areas that may be areas of expertise, they may be areas in which you work, and um, there may be someone who maybe you collaborate with or someone whose work you're very familiar with, someone that maybe you have a working relationship with. 
um, even with it being blinded. And so if you find yourself um, reading through a proposal and you know who the author is just by reading the work, you have to make a decision. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's an honor code. You have to make a decision about ethically, does it make sense for you to continue reviewing if this is someone that you have, um, you know, some kind of connection relationship to where you're very familiar with the work? Because in that way, you're not really giving that person a fair review because you, you know, you're someone who's already very, um, you know, well-versed and connected to it. But, you know, that doesn't happen all the time, I would say, and others can chime in. I, I think that's a rarity that that happens um, because, you know, obviously people are um, also presenting or proposing new work and things that, that they're doing. So it's not something that I would say is common. The proposal title should not contain the author's last name. That wouldn't be a blinded review. And that the, the, references, the references all should have author, not the mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. Yes, are there any more questions? We'll use our wait time. If there are no questions, that means we did a really thorough and excellent job. Oh, thank you, Julia. <laughs> so there's a question about when will the proposals begin to arrive? So, um, you know, March 1st was the deadline. Area chairs are now going through the initial screening process. Some of the area chairs have been very efficient and have already sent out and assigned reviews. But technically, um, our kind of, our, our timeline was that from March 1st to March uh, 18th, reviewer, or excuse me, area chairs would be screening proposals and making sure that they're ready for review. And so, you would see proposals being assigned and out by March 18th, people should have reviews. But I would say that that's happening sooner because the area chairs, um, the teams are just so efficient in getting the work done. So you, you, should, you will be, begin seeing um, reviews, uh, proposals pretty soon. And the other thing that I would say, um, you know, I've instructed area chairs to be really mindful of, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to expect across um, the areas that you volunteer to review for, for you to do, you know, around an average of 10 reviews um, with one person. And that's why it's so important that we have as many people um, to sign up and to volunteer so that we can really balance out and share, share the labor, share the load across, across the field. The other thing that you should know, because I know we have a lot of doctoral students um, reviewers is that we tend to um, we make sure that there's no more than one uh, doctoral student or early career scholar uh, reviewing a proposal so that there's also a balance in terms of experience and expertise that's also important there was another question um, uh, yes I just have a very quick question I, actually it's the same question uh, basically, what if a participant, what if a, um, a author submit a proposal and in the title of the proposal, that if that's a, a PDF document, that in the title, the author includes his or her last name, but maybe when it's first screened, maybe that name will be deleted, like, right? So it's like, process right I, I guess yes so to to answer the question um, when the re area chairs review that proposal they would notice right away if the author's name was for some reason in the title and um, it's possible and I, and I don't know that this has happened but it's it's very possible especially if they consult with me they would reach out to those authors and give them an opportunity to block copy the proposal and have them resubmit it because we wouldn't want that um, proposal to go out unblinded. Um, 
Okay, but I think my question is that since the deadline is March the 1st, is there a way for the author to change the title or? No, well, that's what, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's my point. Um, so between March 1st and March 18th, the area chairs now, so the area chairs are all reviewing, they're reading through and reviewing all of the proposals. And so if they find for some reason someone submitted a proposal on March 1st that they forgot to, to blind copy it and they didn't remove their name, they won't, we won't just automatically reject the proposal. They would give the person an opportunity to go in and um, make the change and then we have time to resubmit it before we send it out to review. Okay. I, okay. I so those, and again, those are rare, rare cases, but we want to be humanizing in our approach as area chairs and as conference chair, because sometimes it, you know, sometimes you might submit the wrong proposal. I mean, all kinds of things happen that um, proposals might not be all the way ready. And again, it's very few cases, but when it does happen, we can make the, you know, the right judgment to say, let me give this person an opportunity to, to make this change before we send it out. Okay. I okay. See. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, no, so not from one area to the question about, there's a question, are we getting around 10 proposals from one area? Um, the answer to that, we would say 10 proposals. If you only volunteered for one area, the area chairs can see, and then they might give you upwards of 10 for that one, one area. Um, but because you can volunteer for multiple areas, um, it's, we would want to make sure that your total across, depending on how many. So if you say, let's say you, assign, you volunteered for two areas, we would only assign maybe five in each area. So no more than across. Are there other questions? I see we're coming to time. Um, I don't know if there were some that I may have missed. There was one question about how reviewers will know if they were selected to be a reviewer. Um, and, um, and then there was another question about whether or not a, grad, a graduate student needed to indicate uh, that in their application. And, um, and on the first point, you'll know that you were assigned as a reviewer when you receive re, uh, proposals to review. Um, and so if you, if you receive proposals to review, then um, that means that you were selected. And that probably, there's no other blanket notification that you've been selected as a reviewer. And then the second point about um, um, whether or not you need to contact an area chair to let them know that you're a student, when you sign um, up to be a reviewer, it should be part of your LRA profile and therefore, or a selection box, so, um, so your area chairs will know. And if they're not sure, they can contact you and ask you about whether or not you're a student or a um, faculty member. Okay, we have about two more minutes. Any other questions? Of course, if you do have questions as you begin the process, please reach out to your um, area chairs. You can also reach out to the um, program chair if you have additional questions that your area chair may not be able to assist you with. We appreciate all of your time and energy. Thank you so much to all of the folks who joined us um, with your expertise, Barbara, Melissa, um, Elizabeth, Marcel, thank you so much. And we look forward to reviewing proposals and shaping the program for the 2018 conference. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us.